Hello, everyone. Looking forward to connecting with you today. Antarctica, Agartha, Chaco Canyon, the Ancient Arrow Project. It's going to be a lot of exciting information today, um, stuff that I've never shared before. Fasten your seat belts. We're going to go nice and deep. I welcome you back. Uh, the last video, which is just a bit of a test run, the last stream, I should say, I'm now streaming. Um, you know, just basically checked in. I uh, offered some intentions to share today about uh, Antarctica and Agartha and uh, some findings, I guess, research given to me by Grandfather Martin. It's very secret knowledge um, that was told to me to be very cautious of and protective of and to be mindful of who I share it with. So uh, it's taken me a while to compile this. And I feel like because of the fact that there's so much attention being given to Antarctica right now and so many people questioning as to why it's uh, closed off and being controlled by the military, that we might as well go deep on this topic and, uh, and chat about it. I'm not saying that I know anything. Once again, I'm just relaying and sharing the messages and teachings and information that was given to me by my elders. So once again, uh, if you're familiar with some of my videos, specifically the return path, you'll uh, come to know that I went to see the Hopi and specifically worked with Grandfather Martin for a number of years to uh, receive some teachings, messages, and warnings, prophecies uh, that specifically relate to the return path. Um, those messages, prophecies, and warnings essentially relate to what we're experiencing as a human global family right now in these times. They've had these prophecies and messages and this information for centuries. It's meant for this time, this time of chaos and great change. And it's ultimately here to provide us with a tool so that we can help uh, each other walk in balance and stay unified and and uh, reconnect with nature and um, make sense of a lot of the chaos. So the first time that I went to see Grandfather Martin, uh, we made an exchange of many different things, sacred art items and artifacts and so forth. And one of the things that he came back with, to me with um, was this information that pertained from what I've discovered to Antarctica and Agartha and, and a lot of sacred ancient knowledge specifically that actually relates back to their origins and also connects to our Tibetan brothers and sisters as well. I'm going to share, you know, just a few things and tidbits. I, I welcome you to do your own research and do some digging. It's absolutely impossible for me to share everything here. I would honestly be reading for hours and hours. I will do my best to respond to any questions and uh, you can always contact me through the comments section or what have you and I'll get back to you for sure. And once again, this is a culmination of intra or information that was given to me and I've been very precautious and intentional about uh, how and when I was going to share it. And since we're on such a hot topic of Antarctica and what's going on in the south and sort of all the protection and secrecy around that and then UAPs or UFOs and aliens and all these different things. Um, I felt this is time to break it out because this information has exactly to do with all of that. And a lot of the stuff, of course, that we're being fed through the media and the government and what have you is not only inaccurate, but in some cases, barely scratching the surface. I'm going to give you lots of resources. So if you don't have a pen and paper, whatever, or a way to uh, take notes, then you can rewatch this after it's recorded and, and then go back and uh, dive in deeper. Back in the 1920s, Admiral Byrd, a admiral for the U.S. Navy Armed Forces, flew down to Antarctica on five different missions. And through those missions, he connected with, I guess some, some would say extraterrestrial beings. Um, you know, he definitely met with disc-like aircraft and was directed and communicated with what Grandfather Martin referred to as superhumans 
through his experience when he entered the entrance. And so the, the first route of investigation and research that I encourage all of you to do is to track down and read Admiral Byrd's diary. Now, there was only about 160 pages released. There's apparently over 190, which sort of summarize his experience and also allude to a lot of the stuff that he revealed on his last days that was really not revealed in the original sort of diary releases. So um, it's difficult to find, but you can find it. And that is the first indication to you sort of what was discovered down there on those journeys and how this secrecy began. As I said, the military and the media, they do their best to confuse us and mislead. We know all too well over the last several years, the sort of revelation of media manipulation and misinformation and disinformation and how we can be played and manipulated through that. Uh, things that are meant to be secret or um, questionable are marked or deemed as conspiracy. This information, some of it that I'm going to share with you is online. They've attempted to disprove it, but um, through your own instinct, intuition, your heart, and through your own discovery, I'm sure that you'll resonate with it and you'll quickly come to realize uh, that there's nothing false about it. A lot of it still is online, so I'll, I'm, I'll invite you by providing that information so that you can check it out for yourself. It's quite profound. It's very, very powerful. Um, Admiral Byrd's flights is something that you should definitely investigate. It's, uh, it's very revealing. Uh, the initial reason why they went down or why they sent Admiral Byrd down to Antarctica was to find and investigate um, the Nazis. They were obsessed with forming a military base down there. And so the U.S. was obviously concerned with that and started flying in their own uh, personnel to investigate. So you can find a lot of information online about that, about the Nazis going down there and their expeditions and their missions. The Russians have also launched expeditions up in the North Pole. Um, those missions, from what I understand to a deep, deeper level, weren't to set up military bases. They were because there was an obsession of finding entry points, either through the North or South Pole. So... Um, it was more of an investigation and, and discovery as to the hollow earth theory, theory or, or finding Shambhala, essentially. Investigate that. It's very, very important and it's quite mind-blowing. I can give you a little synapse of, you know, sort of an idea of one of the things or the main thing that was uh, experienced by Admiral Byrd when he went in. Um, so he was met as he flew into the site, I think it was on his second or third mission. I'm not completely accurate, so I don't want to make any false claims, but read the diaries. He was met by a disc-like UAP or UFO. He lost all control of his aircraft. So it was basically just static in the air, lost all control of the controls. And he was spoken to telepathically and then guided into this gigantic entry point or cave where he received instructions from this being that was communicating with them as they progressed into the cave, into the entry point, And they instructed him as to what was going to happen, which included meeting these leaders uh, who were ultimately the representatives and uh, protectors of Shambhala, of Agartha. Agartha was a name or a word that was created by a French author. It's not truly the name of this place. The ancient name for it is Shambhala. The Tibetan people and uh, Hindu people have this in all their folklore and, and all their stories and ancient wisdoms. Admiral Byrd reported that he saw uh, a continent approximately the size of North America and it was super lush and green and Grandfather Martin's accounts, essentially, when he presented this information to me, just to backtrack a little bit, um, the first thing that he brought out to me that you can see in the thumbnail at the beginning of this was a map of Agartha. 
he wasn't necessarily presenting it to me as a literal map, but he was presenting it to me as suggesting that this is something that exists and this is something that's real and it's very real for us. Um, and he suggested or said that this is where we came from and this is where we're going back to. And it said that the Hopi uh, ascended out of a reed of bamboo through Chaco Canyon and the ancient Anastasi site they came up as little people, miniature people. And the Anastasi people were about five feet tall, more or less on average. The men were maybe about five, four, the women were short, about five or less. Um, isn't it interesting that most Hopi are that size as well? And so this is sort of their emergence story, right? And so they, they were led out of the reed of bamboo by the messenger bird, it was a blue bird. And the messenger bird ultimately came to them and told them that they, that it was sent by creator to invite them to the earth's surface to live and be stewards and protectors of the earth. And that there was this kind of like primal, uh, very aggressive race that was ultimately you know, cannibalistic and, you know, there was no state of peace at the time. So the Hopi were to ascend through this be, uh, reed of bamboo um, to the surface to be the guardians or the keepers and to follow Masala's law, um, which has been shared in some of the return path messages that I've uh, posted in videos. Long story short, Chaco Canyon has many sort of cave entrances that they call mines, but they're not really mines, they're entrances. They have been protected and quarantined and sectioned off. Uh, there's been reports of military blocking people from having any access near those ancient sites now. And uh, yeah, for good reason. And so what I understand is from grandfather Martin and his story is when he was saying that that's where they came from, he explained it like he was there yesterday, not like it was some fabricated fantasy story or whatever. And he said, that's where we came from. It's super beautiful. It's very lush. There's trees and green and food everywhere. And the mountains are made of crystals and all the lakes and rivers are all pristine and super clear and clean. And there's superhumans that live down there. Basically, what they are, are kind of reflections or they're dimensional doubles. And so as they live on the earth plane, they are kind of guided by their higher dimensional double below the earth plane. And once they come to that higher state of consciousness, uh, evolution, awareness, and growth, whatever it is, or it's their time to transcend and leave their bodies, they go back and reunite with their dimensional double. So that's the same, more or less the same stories that the Tibetan people follow, especially the lamas and the ancient ones, the wisdom keepers. And it also aligns with the Hindu teachings as well. So I would like to move forward with just referring to this as Shambhala, because ultimately that's what it is. That map that uh, you can find online that I've posted in the thumbnail there, it shows a lot of critical entry points that are very um, highly discussed, controversial, and protected. And you can see a few of them named on that map. It's just a kind of a cartoon illustration. It's not absolutely literal. However, there are, as they say, uh, entry points in the north and south and the south is one of the greater ones and there's been countless reports of uh, UAPs or UFOs flying in and out of there um, it's the reason why the Nazis were so obsessed with forming their base there it's the reason why it's a no-fly zone and it's so protected uh, Chaco Canyon over the Anastasi site is actually a no-fly zone as well permanently and uh, you can't even fly drones in there like it's it's very protected so isn't that interesting? There are a lot of these entry sites. And from what I understand from the messages that I've uh, 
uh, been lucky to receive is that you cannot just go into these entry points that you need to maintain uh, a certain vibration and intention and clarity. You ultimately need to be invited in. If you're not invited, you can't just go in because you, you need to be like clear and pure and aligned. And so they're very highly protected ultimately um, by these gatekeepers. I believe that the reason why this is being protected and withheld by us or from us, I should say, is because there's obvious uh, reason why, you know, the higher ups or big brother would not want us to have this knowledge or access or another sort of document or study that you might want to check into is called the ancient arrow project. It specifically refers to the uh, ancient Anastasi site in Chaco Canyon. And the ancient arrow site is very significant in the set sense that that is the emergence point for the Hopi, but it also has a cave uh, section where these hikers uh, just mistakenly found uh, an entry point, a huge cave and an entry point after a rock slide. So before it was covered, the rock slide pro provided access to it. They gained entry and they went in and it had a huge cavern that went down like a tunnel into this long hallway and it was all carved out to perfection. There wasn't a single speck of dust, not a rock, not a pebble or a grain of sand anywhere in this chamber, okay? Or in this hallway in this, this entry point. And then in this hallway, there were corridors that split into 23 chambers. And in these chambers, there are illustrations. There's also writings and inscriptions and symbols. So the paintings I discovered are ultimately maps of star systems and astrological alignments that happen, I presume, at certain specific times that are quite significant. And they're sort of disguised and mapped out in these paintings. And they're very abstract, they're almost Dali-like. And this website, as I mentioned, is um, ultimately one of the sites that they have just constantly tried to discredit and spread dis disinformation about to somehow imply that, you know, the people that are putting it up are loony and crazy and it's just conspiracy. Discover it for yourself. I'm going to share some of the information, as I said, that was given to me by Martin, as well as a um, sort of secret interview study uh, research that was done by government officials, um, kind of like a black op program. But it was presented and done and given to Grandfather Martin that he ended up passing on to me. So the Ancient Arrow Project is a series of sort of these artifacts, the site in ancient uh, the Chaco Canyon area, as well as this culmination of information uh, that pertains to these chambers that they found um, down in this underground uh, tunnel system. So you can read about it and find it on a website called The Wingmakers. And you can just go to wingmakers.com and you'll find the illustrations in there. And these illustrations are the artifacts or paintings that they found in the chambers. And then they also found artifacts which are not published on the website. Uh, I'd like to do presentations about this in person because it's very, very deep information and it goes a lot longer than what I'd like to include in a video. And uh, it's very profound and certainly welcomes you know, questions and uh, feedback and so forth and interactions. So I'm going to propose that uh, anybody that's really psyched about this could offer me an invitation to your community to uh, share this at some point. And uh, more than happy to bring all this with me and present it in person. The Wingmakers have specifically created this whole presentation and the wing makers essentially are what are known as time travelers, uh, not only to ancient people, but uh, the Hopi and 
The wingmakers are ultimately messengers and they're here to teach us about the sovereign integral, which are universal laws, peace laws, and ways of being, ways of conducting ourselves. They've created music and the music is presented together with these illustrations that are found in the chambers, as well as the language or writings. And it gives us this transcendental awakening experience that activates our dormant DNA, as well as our cellular memory, our ancestral memory, and helps to guide us to these clues, this sort of cosmic information that's mapped out in the stars within the illustrations. And the sound works together with the illustrations. Uh, you can find the illustrations online, as I said, on the wingmakers.com site. Uh, the music, I'm not sure. I think it's on there now. I think they have MP3s that you can listen to. And so you listen to the music while you're looking at the illustrations, but they are included in the information that I have with Martin. And I'm going to share a couple of paragraphs of, of those messages with you, which are incredibly profound. Chaco Canyon, uh, as I said, is the place of emergence. And there's a couple of significant caves there, entry points. The Anastasi, it's another word for the ancient ones. Okay, It was the, a word that was given to them by the Navajo. The Navajo are also descendants of Anasasi, and they're basically just the first ones, the ancient people. And the Hopi do say that they were the first ones um, to come up and emerge onto the Earth's surface. Yeah, everything correlates with the information and the teachings that Grandfather Martin has given me. And uh, it's just unbelievable what this reveals. So I really feel like this is the reason why they're blocking off Antarctica and why there's so much protection and so much hype about it. It's because it is a significant entry point. I think that this is where there are communications and interactions going you know, back and forth between uh, earth beings and uh, these interstellar visitors and these superhumans that uh, occupy Shambhala. Yeah, they're just trying to hide it from us. But now, as we know, this is coming out in all of these uh, Congress and uh, Senate testimonies, finally. But as I said, they're really scratching the surface of what's actually going on. We've had extraterrestrial beings and contact with these superhuman beings since time immemorial. I believe that our ancient peoples here from Turtle Island were in contact with them. Um, I believe that they are uh, relatives or descendants or even ancestors of the Atlanteans and Lemurians, and they've been here all along. So they are ultimately our keepers, um, potentially, as some may say, working on behalf of the Galactic Federation to ultimately be the prime caretakers and guardians of the Earth and sort of the higher ancestral keepers, I guess, mirrors of the physical Hopi who live on the earth plane. This is my understanding. Um, so I'm gonna read a few things that are not included in the wing makers information. And then afterwards, I, I'm just gonna leave this with you and I'm gonna give you some resources and I'm just gonna let you digest this and then perhaps go a little bit deeper if there's a request or a demand for it. And like I said, if you're interested in uh, diving deep and, and bringing this to your family and community, I'm more than willing to travel and uh, bring everything with me in person so that people can see it firsthand. After reading the interviews, so in this information that I received with from Grandfather Martin, I received the first and second interviews. And it's interesting because in these first and second interviews, they refer to the interviewer and the interviewee as Anne and Dr. Anderson, which is kind of bizarre because initially that's where their names were on the first Wingmakers website. But now what's weird is they're calling them Sarah and Dr. Neruda. I'm assuming that Dr. Neruda is kind of the government scientist um, representative that's 
that are bringing this information to the masses and to um, the person that's representing the wing makers, essentially. I'm not sure why the names were changed um, and it would be a good thing to find out what the significance are of those names are, if they're fictitious names or if they're actually accurate and which ones are accurate. But these are, you know, there's, I believe there's five interviews and they're referred to as the Neruda interviews. So you can find those on the Wingmakers website. So there's five of them all together. The information that Grandfather Martin gave me had the first two interviews in it. And so what I'd like to read and just touch on a little bit, as I said, I can't read everything, it's too long, is Anne's or Sarah's journal findings. So this is kind of her summarization of everything. It says, Anne is the journalist who was originally contacted by Dr. Anderson, you know, better known as Dr. Neruda, who knows, the defective, uh, defected, sorry, scientist of the ACIO to get the story of the wingmakers out to the general public. In this section are some of her initial notes related to her early discussions with Dr. Anderson. It's Anne's goal to update this section with new information as soon as she is able. Notes from Dr. Anderson of the ACIO, written May 27th, 1998 by Anne. What follows are some of my notes taken while the er earnest discussions with Dr. Anderson from the ACIO during the last two weeks of December 1997 before he disappeared, at least off my radar screen. Dr. Anderson is about six feet tall, perhaps 170 pounds, has relatively long black hair, and by all appearances seems Peruvian, or at least from somewhere in South America, though I've never asked. I would guess he's about 50 years old with just a few tinges of gray hair. He called me out of the blue one day in mid-December 1997. His opening line to me was something like, my name is Dr. Anderson, and I have secret information about the future of humankind that provides or proves the existence of time travel technology. Being a journalist by profession, it got my attention, though the whole time I spent on the phone with him, my skeptical nature was in high gear. I always assume stories of fantastical nature are false in reality, though the perceiver can think them to be true. And so that is how I operated with Dr. Anderson. I felt him to be genuine and sincere, but probably misguided or in error. However, he was convincing enough to secure a meeting with me so that we met for a few days later at a coffee shop near my home. He didn't fit my general stereotype view of a scientist. He was much more sophisticated and even elegant in his demeanor and looked as much like an executive of a Fortune 100 company as anything else. His charisma and articulate manner immediately impressed me and I sensed that he was not a man of mental instability prone to wild claims. He told me that he had no recollection of his original parents and that a high ranking member of the Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization, ACIO, had raised him. So his entire life was involved in one way or another with the ACIO. His adoptive father raised him as a single parent. He had been told that his mother had died from breast cancer shortly after he had been adopted when he was only two weeks old or two years old. He attended the best private schools and additionally had been provided with special tutors, which he later learned were from the ACIO. For the most part, he grew up a fairly normal boy until the age of 14 when he came under the formal tutelage of his future colleagues from the ACIO. By the time he was 17, he had left school and decided to pursue an internship at the ACIO, though he said at the time it was simply called the NSA, Specials Projects Laboratory, and was an unacknowledged department in the NSA. His internship lasted for two years, and he never pursued a formal degree at a university, though he claimed to have knowledge about physics and the life sciences that is far in advance of this curriculum of the best universities. He stated that he believed in himself to have possessed average intelligence until he became or began his training as internship. He said that he had technologies that stimulated certain aspects of the central nervous system and brain that increased raw intelligence by as much as 500%. In addition, he claimed that there was a genetic implant technology 
that increase the ability to memorize and retain information to the point where the entire scientific core of the ACIO had perfect photographic memory. This enabled them to build their group intelligence beyond the genius of any one individuals. These technologies, he claimed, were of extraterrestrial origin derived from a friendly source that have been visiting Earth for thousands of years, but had arrangements with the ACIO dating from 1959 that were secret even from government and its intelligence agencies. The alien race, which he called the Cordium, had infiltrated the ACIO in 1958. And though he wasn't specific about how this occurred, he did say that the Cordium are still working with the ACIO to see technologies on Earth that are superior to our native technologies. The technologies to accelerate and enhance intelligence were the first technologies to be transferred, and these were to enable the ACIO scientists to simulate and utilize subsequent technologies that the Cordium brought to the ACIO. In exchange for these technologies, the Cordium were provided safe haven within the ACIO intelligence structure. In other words, the Cordium were permitted access to all of the information systems of the ACIO, which are considerable, according to Dr. Anderson. They were also able to use facilities of the ACIO, including their laboratories, considerable land holdings, and scientific brain power. This unfettered access to the ACIO intelligence provided the Cordium leaders with insight into the structure of world government, where the power centers were, who the real leaders were, and how critical decisions were made from the world's elite. According to Dr. Anderson, the Cordium are benevolent and had no ulterior motives to take over the earth and rule in dictatorship. Let me repeat that. According to Dr. Anderson, the Cordium are benevolent and had no ulterior motives to take over the earth and rule in dictatorship. In fact, they were much more interested in establishing diplomatic ties to the various world governments through the United Nations at the appropriate time which was considered to be shortly thereafter, the year 2011. The existence of the Cordium was kept from the NSA, and even most ACIO personnel were unaware of their existence, though I don't know how this was accomplished. Within the ACIO, there are 14 distinct levels of security clearance. Those who are at level 12 and above are aware of the Cordium Technology Transfer Program, TTP, and they, according to Dr. Anderson, are about 120 in number and are primarily in India, Belgium, and the United States. There are only seven who have level 14 clearance, and they are the directors of intelligence, security, research, special projects, operations, information systems, and communications. These directors report to the executive director, who is known simply as 15 which is the unique classification that is reserved for the head of the ACIO. 15 in the eyes of Dr. Anderson is the most powerful human on the planet. And what I think is meant by powerful is that 15 is able to deploy technologies that are well in advance any that our world's governments have access to. However, Dr. Anderson portrayed 15 and his seven directors as a benevolent force not a hostile or controlling force. The eight people who compromise this inner sanctum of the ACIO are in possession of radical technologies that have been part of the Cordium TTP. However, there were also other extraterrestrial technologies that have been derived from recoveries of spacecraft or other alien artifacts, including various discoveries contained in ancient texts that have never been revealed before. All of this information and technology had been collected and developed within the ACIO scientific core, all of who possesses clearances of level 12 or higher. So my feeling is these ancient texts they might be referring to are the integral sovereign. It takes these technologies and dilutes them to the point where the ACIO or special projects laboratory will sell them to private industry and government agencies, which includes the military. Surprise, surprise. The secret organization is the most powerful organization on earth, in Dr. Anderson's opinion, but they do not choose to exercise their power in a way that makes them visible. Thus, 
Their power is only discernible to their members. For about 40 years, they have accumulated considerable wealth apart from the NSA's oversight. They have managed to build their own security technologies that prevent detection from the intelligence agencies like the CIA or KGB. They are, for all practical purposes, in total control of their agenda. Perhaps this is what makes them a unique organization. Dr. Anderson had clearance of level 12 and was still kept from vital information that only the director level was aware of. And it was assumed that even 15 kept vital information that his directors, though this was never a certainty. The symbol used by the Labyrinth Group is four concentric circles, each circle representing a clearance level, 12, 13, 14, 15. Each circle had a unique insight into the agenda of the Labyrinth Group and its coordination with the Cordium. 15 was an enigma to everyone within the Labyrinth Group. He had been a physicist before he became the executive director of the ACIO. He was a renegade because he had never interacted with the protocols and the political environment of academia. He operated outside of the institutions and was selected to be part of the ACIO because of his combination of brain power, independence, and relative obscurity within scientific circles. He was one of the first to make contact with the Cordium and establish communication with them. The Cordium essentially appointed 15 as their liaison to the ACIO, and 15 became the first to utilize the intelligence accelerator technologies that the Cordium initially offered. That's just uh, a little bit of a taste of this uh, kind of recollection um, and summary that Sarah, this interviewee, or Anne, as they call her, in the findings that were given to me by Grandfather Martin, and it goes far deeper. So there's, yeah, I would say probably a good 40 pages of this summary. And it's, the, uh, it's verified by the managing director of the ACIO. I can't possibly share it all here right now, but uh, there is an ACIO project document overview. It's a memo. And I'll just read the first few uh, paragraphs of that. So... ACIO project documents. The memorandums that are posted here are the original uncensored memo memos written by colleagues of Dr. Anderson. that are 14 memos in total that Dr. Anderson has in his possession that are all related to the wing makers and the ancient arrow site. Three representative me memos have been posted at this time and they provide an insight into the ACIO and Labyrinth Group, how they view the time capsule and interrelate among themselves. Additional memos may be posted in the future. For strategic reasons, they have been withheld at this time. Project Overview Memo, Wingmaker's Ancient Arrow Project, from the desk of Jeremy Sothers, PhD, Director of Special Projects, ACIO, Classified Documentation, number 040297-14X-P as in Peter, 17, double A as in Alpha, dash 23, to all Labyrinth group members, dash F Y E O project interview based on all available research of the ancient aero time capsule. Wing makers seem to represent themselves as future aspect of human race from time approximately 750 years in our future. They represent a version of humanity that has comprehension of the universal systems that govern existence or at least the laws of time and space. This understanding permits the wingmakers to travel back in time and interact with humankind at various points in his evolutionary pathway. I would speculate that wingmakers have, throughout history, been variously referred to as angels, gods, spirit guides, and in some instances, extraterrestrials. They imply that they are adept and subtly interacting with humankind in order to evolve its understanding of the cosmological environment in which life evolves and transforms. After successfully decoding the first 23 segments of the optical disc, they found a disc in one of the chambers, in the 23rd chamber that they decoded essentially and deciphered that contained the music and the messages, the, the words. 
And so I believe the 23 segments refer to those 23 chambers. I will share a small excerpt from their introduction as it were. You may refer to us as the wingmakers. We are most often confused with angels, though we are actually quite human. Just a future, perhaps more advanced version. Humans conditions as they are seem unable or unwilling to comprehend the vast diversity of living beings amongst the cosmological planes of existence. And so somewhat as a defense mechanism, lump together what are distinctly unique beings. The angelic kingdom is a different species of life when compared to the human or the wingmakers format of existence. Wingmakers exist outside of time's focus. While their human extraterrestrial and angelic counterparts exist within and to various degrees are bound by the principles of time. Our uniqueness stems from our ability to operate independently of time while remaining human with all the physical and mental characteristics therein. I believe that it's quite possible that the wingmakers are the Maya or that the Maya are renamed as the wingmakers in modern time. Um, because they are known to all ancient cultures as the masters of time travel. It's just my opinion. Wingmakers and their existence appear to be woven into virtually all cultures and civilizations upon Earth and appear to be commonly represented through mythological and religious stories. Their stated purpose is to be the culture bearers, bringing the seeds of language, art, philosophy, science, reasoning, and spiritual understanding to the human's race throughout time. Apparently they perform this duty without recognition, preferring to be unknown until the time is ripe to present themselves and their specific mission. I think we have to assume based on the available data that the wingmakers operate at the pinnacle of human existence since they are interactive time travelers. Hence, potentially why all these beings are starting to appear and present themselves on such a higher level now because it's that time. Also, why I'm sharing this information. Everything is imperfection. The interaction with humans seems limited to select individuals who, during their dream state, are more accepting of new ideas and insights. These insights often filter into the contactee's waking life in the form of inventions and sudden discoveries. In rare instances, I believe wingmakers will have been will even physically appear, but knowing to the time shift from which they come, their bodies would appear to be constructed of light and their communication, if there was any, is mostly telepathic. Um, the light beings that we witnessed in the desert that eventually came back to visit some of my friends in Leon, Guanajuato in Mexico, where these silhouetted light beings, their bodies appeared to look like they were made out of pure light or like a flame and you couldn't focus on them. Apparently these, my friends were trying to take pictures and videos of these beings and I couldn't capture them. And then one of my friends, oddly enough, captured one shot on a flip phone on a super cheap flip phone of all things. Um, so anyhow, back to this, according to the records of the ancient arrow site, it was the wing makers who originally seeded life upon earth and facilitated life's elevated, evolutionary leaps and biological transformations. They, and we, according to them, originated from the star system Pallades. They came as the human genotype and brought with them a library of genetic codes that, through experimentation, produced the human species and, of course, most other life forms on Earth. Through their time travel technology, they planted time capsules from their future time, which they hope will provide a sense of connection to our future selves and an understanding of human destiny. They seem to be particularly interested in helping present day humans build a global culture. One of their most outlandish claims is that they essentially seeded the concept of the internet for the purpose of developing this global culture. They believe the internet will somehow become the platform upon which their time capsules will be fully launched into the mainstream of the world's citizens. They predict and I use the word with chilling precision, that the time, their final time capsule is, is discovered in 2023. The internet will be the focal point of the new global culture and will become the gateway to a connected intragalactic digital nervous system. They refer to this global culture as the sovereign integral, 
which is difficult to translate into English. However, Dr. Stevens and Whitehall believe it's the means that the global culture of Earth will be both developed and distributed through the internet, and that this global connectivity will enable Earth to be integrated with other planets in our galaxy through an extension of this network. They use the example of Earth as being a node on a cosmological network, and the sovereign integral is simply the Earth's global culture presented to the galaxy in a way that it can harmonize with the other planetary nodes. So I wanna read you some excerpts, and I, I can't read this whole thing like I said, it's, it's very lengthy and deep, but as I said, I would more than happily come and present this information in person. I'll basically go through that, and then I'm going to I'll read you some of the Sovereign Integral writings, and then I'm going to share uh, a couple other findings and conjectures and uh, translations about the paintings and, I guess, explanation of the date findings. So the Sovereign Integral is just absolutely beautiful. There's really no other words for it. I guess like it, like they, you know, suggest it's, it's really hard to put into English um, for me to even describe it. Um, perhaps close your eyes or just bring yourself into real true presence here because these words are just like nectar for the soul. Life principles of the sovereign integral. The entity model of expression is designed to explore new fields of vibration through biological instruments and transform through this process of discovery to a new level of understanding and expression as a sovereign integral. The sovereign integral is the fullest expression of the entity model within the time space universes and most closely exemplifies source intelligence's capabilities therein. It is also the natural state of existence of the entity that has transformed beyond the evolution saviorship model of existence and has removed itself from the controlling aspects of the hierarchy through the complete activation of its embedded source codes. This is the level of capability that was seeded within the entity model of expression when it was initially conceived by prime creator. All entities within the time-space universes are in various stages of the transformational experience and each are destined to achieve the sovereign integral level as their so source codes become fully activated. The transformational experience is the realization that the entity model of the expression is capable of direct access to source intelligence information and that the information of prime creator is discovered within the entity level of the sovereign integral. In other words, the human instrument complete with its biological, emotional, and mental capabilities is not the repository of the entity's source codes, nor is the human instrument able to reach out and gather its liberating information, this glorious freedom to access all that is. It is the entity that is both the harbor of and instrument of access to the source coding activation that permits the transformational experience to manifest through the integration of the human instrument and the sovereign entity. The transformational experience consists of the realization that the perceived reality is source reality, personified in the form of individual preferences. Thus, source reality and the sovereign reality become inseparable as the wind and air. This confluence is realized only through the transformational experience, which is unlike anything known within time-space universes. There have been those upon Terra Earth who have experienced a shallow breath of wind from this powerful tempest. Some have called it ascension. Others have attributed names like illumination, vision, enlightenment, nirvana, and cosmic consciousness. While these experiences are profound in human standards, they are only the initial stirrings of the sovereign integral as it becomes increasingly adept at touching and awakening the remote edges of its existence. What most species define as the ultimate bliss is merely the impressions of the sovereign integral whispering 
to its outposts of form and nudging them to look within their roots of existence and unite with this formless and timeless intelligence that pervades all. The information experience is far beyond the calibration of human drama, much like the stars are in the sky, beyond the touch of Terra Earth. You can observe the stars with your human eyes, but you will never touch them with your human hands. Similarly, you can dimly foresee the transformational experience within the human instrument, but you cannot experience it through the human instrument. It is only accessed through the wholeness of the entity, for it is only in the wholeness that the source codes and their residual effects of source reality perception can exist. And truly, this wholeness is only attained when the individual consciousness is separated from time and is able to view its existence in timelessness. Nevertheless, the human in instrument is critical in facilitating the transformational experience and causing it to trigger like a metamorphosis, the integration of the formful entities into the sovereign integral. This is the next stage of perception and expression for the entity model and its activation when the entity designs its reality from life principles that are symbiotic of source reality, as opposed to the reality of an internal source that is bound to the evolution saviorship model of existence. These life principles are source intelligent templates of creation. They are designed to create the reality from the perspective of the sovereign integral and hasten its manifestation within the fields of vibration that has thus far repelled it. There are principles that construct opportunities for the integration of the entity's formless and formful identities. They are bridges that the human instrument, with all of its componentry intact, can experience the sovereign integral perception of wholeness. That's just a taste. This goes on. I'm uh, just going to read little pieces of it here, just to kind of give you a little taste see how this resonates with you. I, it's so profound to even read these words. It's so powerful. There are three particular life principles that are accelerate, that accelerate the transformational experience and help to align the human instrument with the sovereign integral pr perspective. They are universe relationship through gratitude, observance of source in all things, nurturance of life. When the individual applies these principles, their life experience reveals a deeper meaning to its apparently random events, both in the universal and personal contexts. And there's a breakdown here, like universe relationship through gratitude, and then observance of all of source in all things, and then nurturance of life. And it goes super deep into all of that. Yeah, once again, um, I would love to be able to just sit here and read all of this, but it would literally be, you know, a 10 hour stream. And it's just stuff that I really feel I should share in person. It's very heartfelt. It's very moving. It's very deep and profound. I want to keep this video concise so people are sort of inspired to, uh, to check it out and explore it. Just to give you a little uh, idea, human instrument. This is a bit of a glossary that they have in the back. So the human instrument, the human instrument consists of three principal components, biological, physical body, the emotional and the mental and the entity. The entity model of consciousness ex encompasses the individuated spirit, sometimes referred to as the higher self or soul. Sovereign integral. The sovereign integral is a state of consciousness whereby the entity and all of its various forms of expression and perception are integrated as a consciousness wholeness. Prime creator. Prime creator is the primal source from which all existence is ultimately linked. It is sometimes referred to as the body of collective God. It represents the overarching consciousness of all things unified. This is important. Olin technology, which is something that's mentioned deeper into the context or the texts and information that I have here. Olin technology, spelt with a capital O L I N as in Norman. Intelligent networks are able to operate from a single language with translation interfaces that enable global intercourse. This means language is no longer a barrier to communication. Intelligent networks will introduce a meta language that will or that translates both real-time written and spoken applications. It will revolutionize the genetic mind's global construct and 
facilitate the digitization of your global economy. There will be many within the hierarchy who will object vehemently to the notion of a global digital economy, but we will tell you it will happen regardless of the complaints and registered concerns. Your most powerful banks, computer manufacturers and software companies will merge to create this momentous technology and the one language intelligent network, OLIN, will become the standard operating system of the world's computer-based systems. This will not occur until the year 2008. So that definitely coincides with the collapse and economic breakdown in the US economy and the whole mortgage crisis. This will not occur until the year 2008. So it is some time before you will encounter this globalization of your economy, but all the systems and architecture are already being designed and conceptualized in the minds of some of your brightest engineers and scientists. We assure you this is not something to be feared, but rather embraced and not because of its economic values, but because of the way the Olin technology will facilitate the development of a global culture, obviously referring to crypto. As the Olin technology evolves, it will increasingly become subject to individual control. In other words, individuals will become inextricably linked to the network's entertainment and educational applications, which will become globalized. No longer will the global media companies publish for geographical market. They will produce content for a global audience and each individual will define what and how it desires to be entertained or educated. The Olin technology will know the preferences and interests of every individual to its network and by the year 2016, it will become ubiquitous than telephones in the late 20th century. Hence, the network will be controlled by individuals and producers of content and services will be the slave of reactionary force of the individual. Thus, the individual will need to define their entertainment and educational desires carefully, or the Olin technology will deliver content that is undesirable. So maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's not crypto, maybe it's AI that is ultimately engaged in manipulating the media or you know things like Google or YouTube, interesting. We know this sounds obvious and trite, but it is profoundly different than the way entertainment and education are developed in the world of pre-Olin technology. The time capsules that the wing makers have left behind will act as a template to those who operate outside of, those, of the limiting force of the genetic mind and desire to create content for the Olin technology even before it exists. The time capsules will show how to do this and demonstrate how to create multi-dimensional content that carries its viewer participant into new corridors of understanding and illumination. Sovereign Integral Network. The Sovereign Integral Network, SIN, already exists, indeed has always existed. However, there has not been a way to connect or interface with your technology. Terra Earth has created technologies that are largely mechanistic and electrical in nature, and it's just the beginning to understand the electromagnetic energy fields and holographic technology. Tesla technology. Regret, regrettably, when technologies are in their infantile stages of development, they are very often conformed to a military or economic control application. And this is the case with these emerging technologies. Source intelligence. Source intelligence is the energy consciousness of prime creator that is cast into all worlds, all dimensions, all realities, all life forms, all times and places. Source intelligence is the prime creator projected into all that is. All that is. Source intelligent is the projected intelligence of prime creator. Within this consciousness exists the synthesis and distillation of all that is. This is an infinite library of knowledge and experience that can be tapped into through the attunement and creative will, potentially also referred to as the Akashic Records. Universe of wholeness. The universe of wholeness is the aggregate of all dimensions and realities. It is unified and interconnected through source intelligence. Source codes. Source codes are embedded activators that are present 
within the entity consciousness. They serve specific purpose of awakening the human instrument into its multi-dimensionality of the entity and the liberating information that is stored within the entity consciousness. Source codes are somewhat analogs of the genetic coding of the DNA to the extent that the source codes activate specific blueprints of transformation that accelerate and facilitate the expansion of consciousness. In effect, source codes catalyze the awakening of the human instrument and encourage it to make the quantum leap from a socialized human to a sovereign entity that is aware of its connection to all that is. Super potent. Offering a bit of a background project briefing and back background on um, the ancient arrow project in 1972 in a remote section of northern new mexico a group of hikers discovered an unusual artifact and pictograph within an obscure canyon an archaeologist from the university of new mexico analyzed the artifact and searched the area where it was discovered but found no signs that a prehistoric culture had established any permanent site in the canyon it was presumed that a nomadic Native American Indian tribe had occasionally used the canyon as a temporary settlement and had left behind a few artifacts of their presence as a consequence. They were, however, two very puzzling questions. All but one of the artifacts appeared to be an unusual form of technology and was found among more typical artifacts like pottery and simple tools. The compass was covered in strange hieroglyphs symbols, some of which were also found on the pottery. Secondly, the pictographs that were found in the area had inexplicably appeared, and they were strikingly different than any of the other native pictographs of, or art found in the Southwest or the entire continent for that matter. Anyways, this goes on to refer to how the site was discovered and the NSA got involved in 1973 and then 21 years later in 1994, a series of rock slides opened up a section of the ancient Arrow site. The canyon was in a naturally obscure section of the park and held by the state of New Mexico. Anyhow, that's ultimately at the back of this cavern that was opened up from the rock slide. A research team discovered a well-hidden entrance into the interior of the con uh, canyon a wall or rock structure of the ancient Arrow site. There they found a system of tunnels, as I mentioned earlier, and chambers that had been carved out from solid rock. There were a total of 23 chambers, all intricately connected to an interior corridor, and each chamber held a specific wall painting, series of pictographs, written hieroglyphs, and what seemed to be dormant alien technologies. Okay, and as I repeat, these tunnels and chambers were perfectly carved and cleaned without a grain of sand or a pebble or a rock or anything. And there was no rock or degree outside of the entrance. So where did everything go if it was excavated? And secondly, how was it excavated so perfectly? It's insane. So this is one of the sites, kind of like the entry points the military has had sort of blocked off and protected for quite some time now, as far as I know, since like uh, the 90s or early 2000s. So yeah, it comes, it goes on to explain the ACO, ACIO, sorry, as I talked about earlier, is a secret or unacknowledged department of the NSA. It is headquartered in Virginia, but also have personnel in Belgium, India, and Indonesia. They are largely unknown even to senior directors within the NSA. The ACIO is the lowest profile organization with the entire intelligence community. Its agenda is to research, assimilate, and replicate any technologies or discoveries of extraterrestrial origin. Its personnel consists mainly of scientists who are completely anonymous, yet are paid salaries in excess of 400K a year or more because of their security clearance and IQs. So yeah. The ACIO's finest computer experts were called in to try and unload this encoded disk that I mentioned that was in, uh, found in chamber 23, but to no avail. Several more months were spent trying to use every conceivable method to access the contents of the disk, but nothing worked. The ancient Arrow project for the first time in nearly a year had hit a dead end 
and funding for the project was rapidly weaned by the ACIO. So again, this is, yeah, it's super profound. It connects the ACIO with the ancient arrow project and the wing makers. You know, they even go on to speak now of Lemurian language or Sumerian language here. One day, late in the summer of 1996, one of the scientists, a linguistics expert, had an insight into how to unlock the optical disc by reducing the symbols of the wall paintings, the wall paintings that I mentioned that are in all of the uh, chambers, to their closest facsimile found in an ancient Sumerian text. While the Sumerian language is extinct, it was sufficiently comprehensible to the scientists that he was able to decode the symbols of the paintings and placing 23 words in the same order as the ancient arrow chambers, he was able to finally unlock the optical disc. The connection between the Sumerian language and the time capsule was the breakthrough the ACIO team had been waiting for. A simple set of 23 words incited over 8,000 pages of data from the optical disc. 8,000 pages, damn. Unfortunately, the data was incomprehensible because there was no character set in the computer that could emulate the hieroglyphs and unusual symbols of the language. Thus, a translation index needed to be developed, which took an additional six months. Finally, once a translation index was programmed in the computer disk and data, the data, while it could be printed out or viewed, the partial on the monitor in its hieroglyphic form still required translation into English. The partial translations began to be developed it was determined that even within the optical disk, there was a segmentation of the data into 23 units. Each unit appeared to correspond to a specific chamber. As the first two chambers began to be translated, it was further shown each unit contained philosophical and scientific papers, poetry, music, and an introduction to the culture and identity of its creators. The creators of the time capsule referred to themselves as wing makers. They represented a future version of humanity who lived 750 years in the future. They claimed to be the culture bearers or the ones that bring the seeds of art, science, and philosophy to humanity. Or They had left behind a total of seven time capsules in various parts of the world to be developed and discovered according to a well-orchestrated plan. Their apparent goal was to help the next several generations of humans develop a global culture, a unified system of philosophy, science, and art. And it goes on and on. The, you gotta go in and you gotta read these five interviews. They're completely mind-blowing. Um, I just wanna touch on something here. So there's like the uh, project overview that I mentioned, the memo. I touched on, I didn't mention it. It was written by Jay Sothers, a managing director, special projects of the ACIO. The factors, okay, so there's a language analysis memo here um, that was done by William Stevens, a chief scientist, doc, classified document number 021797-10X-L11, language analysis. And they reveal that the factors and relevant variables in our analysis are the following in no particular order of importance. The wall's paintings, apparent story. The wall's paintings, symbols. The wall's paintings, colors and relative shapes. The wall's paintings, star patterns. The wall's paintings, geographical landmarks. The wall paintings, subject matters. The wall paintings, relative size. The wall paintings, relative order in the 23 chambers. The wall paintings, position on the chamber wall the wall paintings relative distance from each other, the possible relationship between the wall painting and the artifacts in the chamber, the possible relationship between the symbols in a particular wall painting and the pictographs and petroglyphs painted or carved around the ancient arrow site. So anyways, Dr. William Stevens, your chief scientist, I suppose you would be referred to as a doctor, he goes on to like create this artifacts overview memo that I have um, that I would share in person as well. And then he compares like, for example, painting number two found in chamber two, but there are specific positions, solar system um, positionings or solar system diagram that are mapped out in this, which represent uh, 
the May 2000 phases of the new moon moving into a full moon. So it's incredibly accurate and it does map out or match up with the astrological um, alignment that took place on May 7th, 2000. Um, and then we have June 5th, 2000, painting three and chamber three completely aligns, um, which is a sunset over the Reno, Neves Reno Nevada desert, um, a wingmaker painting. And then they have it all mapped out exactly how it is in the celestial sky. July 3rd, 2000, painting number four. It was a sunset uh, over the sky, the mirror. It's a, basically a, a mirror uh, dancing image of the celestial bodies of a kind of a dancing figure of the human uh, stick man dancing. I just want to read like one of the writings in chamber one because I feel like I want to give you a taste and you can find the, the drawings on top or online. I just want to leave you with this and then this is very, very beautiful. Again, these are translations from that disc that correlate and work with the, the drawings, the pictograms that are found in the chambers. Okay, so this is chamber one. And there's two words that go with each chamber. So chamber one, the two words that go with each, or chamber one, are compassion and listening. So compassion. Angels must be confused by war. Both sides praying for protection, yet someone always gets hurt. Someone dies. Someone cries so deep. They lose their watery state. Angels must be confused by war. Who can they help? Who can they clarify? Whose mercy do they cast to their merciless? No modest scream can be heard. No stainless pain can be felt. All is clear to angels except in war. When I awoke to this truth, it was from a dream I had last night. I saw two angels conversing in a field of children's spirits rising like silver smoke. The angels were fighting among themselves about which side was right and which side was wrong. Who started the conflict? Suddenly the angels stilled themselves like a stalled pendulum and they shed their compassion to the rising smoke of souls who bore the watermark of war. They turned to me with those eyes from God's library and all the pieces fallen were raised from in unison, coupled like the breath of flames in a holy furnace. Nothing in war comes to destruction, but the illusion of separateness. I heard this spoken so clearly, I could only write it down like a forged signature. I remember the compassion, mountainous, proportioned for the universe. I think a tiny fleck still sticks to me like a gossamer threads from a spider's web. And now, when I think of war, I flick these threads to all the universe, hoping they stick on others as they did me, knitting angels and animals to the filament grace of compassion, the rectulum of our skyward home. Listening. I am listening for a sound beyond sound that stalks the nightland of my dreams, entering rooms of fossil light, so ancient they are swarmed by truth. I am listening for a sound be beyond us that travels the spine's invisible ladder to the Orphic Library, where the rebel books revel in the unremitting light, printed in gray, tiny words with quicksand depth embroidered with such care, they render the spirit a ghost and a god, or telescope turned backwards upon itself, dreaming us awake. Never blooming thoughts surround me like a regatta of crewless ships. I listen leopard-like, canting off the quarantine of bodies sickened by the monsoon of still hearts. There is certain magic in the heartbeat which crowds the sound I seek, but it is still underneath the beating I wish to go. Underneath the sound of all things huddled against the trap, tracking dishes that they turn their heads to the sound of stars. I am listening for a sound unwound. So vacant it stares straight with the purity to peer into the black madness of time, sowing visions that oscillate in our wombs, bearing radiant forms as they substrate 
of our form. When I look to the compass needle, I see a blade of humility bent to a force waylaid like wild rain channeled in sewer pipes. Running underground in concrete canals that quiver, laughing up at us as though we were lost in the sky world with no channel for our ride. I am listening for a sound in your voice past the scrub terrain of your door where my ear is listening on the other side. Beneath your heart where the words go inward and light consumes the delicate construction of mingled lives. I only listen for the sound I know is there, glittering in that unpronounceable stateless state quarried of limbs so innocent they mend the flesh of hearts. That's just chamber one derived from the two words that were found in the disc, compassion and listening. Wow, it almost brings me to tears to share that. It's just so incredibly beautiful. So there's just one more thing that I wanted to mention. So this is an explanation of the date findings. The date sequence shown in the series of three paintings suggests that the images taken together represent a 23 lunar month time sequence. Each painting represents a lunar month that starts or possibly ends on the first crescent moon. My own research following the clues left by the wing makers suggests that the series represents a, the period of time known to the Hopis as the return path. The sequence commences in April of 2000 and terminates 23 lunar months later. The great shaking appears to commence in painting 22 and painting 23 suggests a renewed state of innocence followed or following the great shaking. A possible exception to the sequence may be found in paintings 15 and 20, which seem to combine to form a larger image. Combining these two paintings may shorten the duration of the cycle. So once again, the paintings are found on the wingmakers.com website. And as I said before, there's been plenty of disinformation, manipulation, uh, conspiracy theory and projection with all this information. The wingmakers are known as time travelers, okay? Grandfather Martin gave me this information that was a uh, private investigation and research that was done by these people that are associated or affiliated with the ACIO, who is a branch of the NSA, who went into study and research the ancient arrow project and their discoveries in Chaco Canyon and these chambers, how they relate to extraterrestrials and the universe and universal language and our process of awakening and full activation. So I hope I'm uh, summarizing that uh, to uh, a digestible level so that people can understand it in simplistic terms. So she says that uh, her conjectures, ultimately other findings and conjectures, it is possible that other paintings in the sequence can be combined, although I have not personally found any other combinations. I su suspect that if combinations exist, they will be with other painting